Every single species is designed to eat a certain type of food, and if they eat something different, they become incredibly sick. For example, lions are a carnivorous species designed to only eat meat, and if they start eating grass, they become incredibly sick. In fact, every single wild animal has very little disease. And where it gets interesting is that as soon as humans take in these animals and start caring for them, feeding them a diet that they're not used to, they get incredibly sick. Now the exact same goes with humans. Wild humans like the Inuit in Alaska have virtually zero illness. They live long and healthy lives. However, civilized humans, one in two of us get cancer. If a species eats its true species appropriate diet, it doesn't get sick. So what is the species appropriate diet that humans are meant to eat? Now for the last year I've obsessed over this topic and after looking at all the evidence, I'm highly convinced that humans are designed to only eat meat. And I've come up with 31 of the most compelling reasons why I believe this to be true. I'm going to keep every point in this video very brief so the video is not three hours long. So I'm only going to touch briefly on each topic. But if you have any questions on any of the points I make, leave them down in the comments and I'll respond to them. Now technically speaking, we only became humans a few hundred thousand years ago. But for the sake of making this video simple, I'm going to refer to our ancestors as humans. The first argument is a rather straightforward one. Intuition. What do wild animals eat? Well it's very simple. They eat what they're intuitively drawn to. Wild animals don't have teams of scientists saying to them, hey, make sure you eat this over here. It contains 100% of your RDA for iron. Even though it tastes terrible, you need to eat this. Instead, it's very simple. If they're drawn to something, they eat it. And a large factor as to what they eat is what tastes good to them. And what are humans intuitively drawn to and what tastes amazing to us? It's very simple. Meat. Think about it. If you went on a massive hike, got lost in the bush for days, and thought to yourself, okay, I need to get something to eat, your first thought would be, which animals are around? And the reason for this is you know that plants are toxic and by eating them it might poison you and you might die. Which rather conveniently brings me into my second point. Plants are toxic. Every single plant on the planet has something known as defense chemicals. And the purpose of these chemicals are to deter it from being killed and eaten. In fact, every single vegetable that humans eat has over 60 identified carcinogens in it. When we eat plants, we get a bad feedback mechanism in the sense that it tastes very bitter, which is our body's way of recognizing the plant's defense chemicals and the carcinogens in that food. An example of one of these defense chemicals are tannins, which are found in foods like kale, spinach, cocoa. Now, when you eat one of these foods with tannins, what happens is that it causes proteins to bind together, which blocks the absorption of nutrients and causes us digestive issues. Which brings me on to my third point, we have no defense mechanisms against these plants. What ends up happening is when a species consumes the same plant for an extended period of time, they start to develop adaptations to counteract these chemicals. This is what is known as the evolutionary arms race, and it's no different to Russia and America racing to see who can have the best weapon. An example of one of these is goats. In their saliva, they have an enzyme called tannus. Now what this enzyme does is when they consume tannins, it breaks it down so it doesn't affect them. Now every single species develops adaptations like this when they consume a plant for an extended period of time. Another example of this is gorillas, who have massive intestines, which allows them to ferment plant material, which turns it into short-chain fatty acids and proteins before they consume it, essentially purifying it so these toxins don't affect them. Humans, on the other hand, have very short intestines and no ability to ferment anything. In fact, we literally cannot digest fiber, which according to all these experts, somehow makes it good for us. What's incredibly fascinating about gorillas is that they eat 18 kilograms of leaves per day, which as we all know with foods like spinach, leaves have virtually no calories in them. So when you look at the total calories that gorillas consume, it seems that they're virtually having nothing. However, gorillas are high in gut digesters, which means that they can use their cecum and large intestines to turn fiber into short-chain fatty acids and proteins, like I mentioned earlier. Now gorillas consume over a kilogram of fiber per day, and this process allows them to turn each gram of fiber into two calories, which significantly bumps their caloric intake up, and even though they have to eat for the majority of their day, it allows them to survive. However, once again, humans can't do this, we literally cannot break down fiber, which is why it has zero calories. The next reason is our stomach pH levels. How this works is the more carnivorous a species is, the more acidic that their stomachs are. For those who don't know, a lower pH means a more acidic stomach. Now meat, as we all know, expires, which means over time it gets pathogens and bacteria on it. However, plants take a lot longer to go off, which is why all carnivore species have very acidic stomachs and the herbivores don't. Now our stomach pH is around 1.5. To put this into context, lions and wolves both have a stomach pH of between 1 and 2, essentially the same as ours. For herbivores, it's much higher. Now for each one increase of pH, is a tenfold increase in acidity. 
So the difference between a pH of 1 and a pH of 3 is 100 times more acidic. The next reason is something known as stable isotopes. Now when we find fossils, they contain nitrogen. The more nitrogen a fossil has, the more carnivorous it is. Now every fossil we find pre-agricultural revolution, which we'll get into shortly, has incredibly high nitrogen ratings, higher than every other species on the planet. Now before we get into the next points, I need to explain this theory. Our earliest ancestors, which had tiny brains like the other primate species, ate predominantly plants. However, something happened two and a half million years ago, which caused our brains to start growing massively. Now this conveniently lines up with when the Ice Age is estimated to start and when we discovered stone tools. Now what the Ice Age meant is that the entire earth was covered in ice, which would have covered a lot of the plants and it would have made it incredibly hard for us to survive only eating plants as there would be so few of them, which meant we had to get creative and start eating animals if we want to survive. Hence why we created stone tools. Now where things get interesting is that only the fatty animals would have been able to survive, which meant that we had access to the right types of fat. The human brain requires 20 and 22 carbon fatty acids. Now this type of fatty acids makes up 90% of the brain material in mammals. In plants, there's only 18 carbon fatty acids, which cannot be used to make this brain material. So there's no explanation for this brain growth other than the increase of animal fats, which, as I mentioned, lines up perfectly with the Ice Age and the introduction of stone tools. Now this brain growth continued to skyrocket up until about 12,000 years ago. And then in the last 12,000 years, they've shrunk 11% again. Now why is this? The agricultural revolution. For the last 12,000 years, humans have been using agriculture to get most of our calories, which lines up perfectly with when the last ice age ended. Now obviously, if the entire earth is covered in ice, it's not possible for agriculture. So this timeline makes perfect sense. This decrease in brain size is due to the fact that we have less 20 and 22 carbon fatty acids in our diet. Now every fossil we found before 12,000 years ago is in perfect shape. There's very little lesions or markings on their bones. Now this is important because these indicate infection or disease. However, in the last 12,000 years, these lesions and markings have been found on fossils. Now isn't this an interesting timeline? Small brain, start eating meat. Big brain, stop eating meat smaller brain and is explained by the fact that we're not having the right type of fatty acids anymore. Another thing we've noticed since the agricultural revolution is a decrease in height. On older fossils that we find, we see tribes of people that are estimated to be six foot two on average, whereas nowadays the average height is five foot seven and a half. On these more recent fossils within the last 12,000 years, we've also started to find cavities on the teeth, which were not present pre-agricultural revolution. It's interesting how the jaw structure of every single human was perfect back then, whereas nowadays many people have very messed up teeth and very small jaws. Now the reason for this is because we've stopped eating meat, we've stopped having to use our jaws, and we don't have access to the nutrients in meat, which helps it form properly. Now over time, we've also had a lot of adaptations that suggest we started hunting more and more. A key one of these are changes in our feet. Our big toes more align with the rest of the foot. We have more of an arch. Our toes are shorter, and as a whole, our foot has become more rigid. All of these suggest we've had to walk and run for greater distances which indicates hunting, as if we were eating plants, we wouldn't have to move around very much. If you look at the way other primates walk who don't move around very much, they're very bent over. However, over time, humans have developed and become more and more upright. The next is a change in our ribcage structure. As we mentioned earlier, it's believed the earliest humans ate plants, which is why when we find very old fossils, we find a very different ribcage structure to the ones we find on humans nowadays. Our old ribcage structure suggests we had much larger intestines than we do now. However, over time this ribcage got smaller and smaller, suggesting our intestines got smaller as they no longer need to ferment plants because we're eating other animals. Now, we've also developed an incredible ability to rotate our shoulders. All you have to do is turn your television on and watch a game of baseball to see this in action. No other species has developed this, and the reason we have is from throwing spears at animals over and over. The next adaptation is that we don't have flat teeth. Herbivore species have flat teeth. Not only are our teeth not perfectly flat, but we've also developed our canine teeth. We also have predator eyes. Now we didn't always have these, and we've developed them over time. The difference between predator and prey eyes is that prey eyes can see in more directions to detect if predators are coming towards them. Now we also have many cave paintings that were found, which depict hunting practices. Now it goes to show how important hunting was back then, if that's what they've decided to draw. And as Dr. Anthony Chafee has made famous, I've never seen a cave painting of a salad. Now another reason is that even so-called herbivores eat meat when given the opportunity, which shows us that intuitively even these animals know that eating meat is the best source for them to get their calories, to avoid the toxins, and to get all the nutrients that they need. And that the reason they don't eat these more frequently is that they're simply not smart enough. 
Now these animals don't have the capabilities like the throwing arm that we have to use these weapons and they're not smart enough to create them in the first place, which is why they're stuck on their herbivore diets and it's why their brains haven't increased in size like ours have. Now another reason is something known as coprolites. Essentially coprolites are fossilized stools of animals and in all these coprolites that we find we never find any plant material, which you'd expect to find at least some seeds if we were consuming plants. However, we do find the remains of smaller animals that we ate, such as fish bones and fish heads. Now a common argument is, why would we want to eat like our ancestors who only lived to 40? However, this is simply not true. There's no way to detect how old someone was when they died simply by looking at a fossil. In the last 12,000 years, there hasn't been a civilization that only ate meat. So it's not like we can just pull up some records and see how old everyone lived eating only meat. But what we do know is that there was less infection and less disease when we ate this way. Now humans, medically speaking, are meant to live to the age of 120. Assuming our bodies don't get in the way of ourselves and there's no inflammation, that's how long every organ in our body is meant to live for. So you'd think that if you ate only the food without a single identified carcinogen that contained every single nutrient we need, that you'd probably live a pretty long and healthy life, right? Another reason why we're meant to be carnivores is exactly that. If meat's the only food without a single identified carcinogen in it, and every other food has some toxins, which we don't have mechanisms to break down, wouldn't that be the best food for us to eat? Now vegetables were sold to us as the best way to get your nutrients in, but we now know that these nutrients in plants are almost impossible for us to break down. However, red meat contains every single nutrient we need in the perfect quantity, assuming that you eat a decent amount of it every day. Now what is the likelihood of this from chance acting alone? Over time, our bodies would have become accustomed to getting this amount of nutrients, which is why in order to thrive, we continue to need that amount. Another reason is that carbohydrates are toxic to us. When we eat carbohydrates, it spikes our blood sugar massively. And high blood sugar essentially kills us. This is called glycation, which essentially means that glucose molecules damage other molecules in our body and inflammation builds up over time. And every single plant contains carbohydrates. Cancer also feeds on sugar. A cancer cell uses considerably more glucose than regular cells. I mentioned earlier that gorillas can ferment plant material and turn it into short-chain fatty acids and protein. Now they're not the only species that can do this, a lot of species do. However, humans can't do this, which is why carbohydrates remain toxic to us. Next reason is that it's the only way we could have got our calories in. As I mentioned earlier with the ice age and all the plants being frozen over, meat was literally the only thing we could eat during this time, so of course we were a carnivorous species. The next point is that ketosis is a massive survival benefit. When you are not fat adapted, as soon as you run out of the calories you've eaten, you become incredibly hungry, lethargic, and you simply feel terrible. Now imagine this happened before we had these things called supermarkets. Every time you run out of calories, you felt terrible. It would make it incredibly hard to get your next meal, which would have inhibited our evolution considerably. However, no other species has evolved like us. The next reason is that it tastes amazing. As I mentioned earlier, our bodies recognize that this is the best food for us, so we get a positive feedback mechanism. Now this brings fruit into the debate, because fruit does taste good to the human palate. At the end of this video, I will link to another video I made, breaking down why I don't think eating fruit is a good idea. Another reason is that we can come up with a best guess. We can look at what wild humans are eating nowadays, and assume that we've probably eaten like this for a while. Now what do wild humans eat? As much meat as they can possibly get their hands on. Sure, when people go visit some of these hunter-gatherer tribes, like the Hadza, we see them eating things like tubers and berries. However, these tribes do not have an abundance of animals around them. And when you say to these people, do you like the tubers? They're not particularly fond of it, which further supports that plants should only be survival foods for humans. We even have a biblical reference for the religious viewers, which tells the story of a man named Abel who offered a sheep to the Lord, and a man named Cain who offered the fruit of the ground to the Lord. The Lord had respect to Abel's offering. However, to Cain, he did not respect this offering which shows meat being regarded as superior to plants. Reason number 30 is that virtually every single person that goes on an all-meat carnivore diet feels way better. Now let's imagine that humans were another species, say your dog for example, and you decide to start feeding it something different. Now obviously your dog's not going to say to you, yo gee, I'm feeling a lot better on this new food you've given me, but you will notice tangible differences in its energy levels. It will be more playful, which is essentially the human equivalent of what happens on a carnivore diet. Now if suddenly this did happen, you changed your dog's food and he's noticeably doing better. There is absolutely zero chance you would come to the conclusion that what he's eating now is worse than what he's eaten before. However, for some reason when humans experience this on a carnivore diet, all these so-called experts like to point at some terrible association studies and tell us that our new diet's worse. And my final point, which is more rebuttal of a vegan argument. Now the argument goes like this. 
Just because some populations were eating meat, it doesn't mean that humans were entirely carnivorous species. Now, this could be rebutted with the Ice Age argument, but instead I've come up with a much more scientific one. If you look at any history book, there were always massive conflicts between civilizations which ended in large-scale wars. So let's imagine two groups got into conflict about something and were going to war. On one side we have these carnival doctors, Sean Baker, Chafee, Ken Berry, and then on the other side we have these vegan doctors. Now imagine entire tribes like this, who do you think would win? Now let's say there was a vegan tribe out there, how long do you think it would last? The reason humans have evolved to such a large degree is because we ate meat for most of our existence. Now have humans eaten plants from time to time, even pre-agricultural revolution? Of course we have, but it doesn't mean they're good for us. We don't have any adaptations to break down their defense chemicals, so in my opinion should only be considered survival foods, meaning we should only use them as a last resort if we're running out of calories. I've been on this all meat diet for about a year now, and I feel incredible. I've dropped 30 pounds with ease, I have unlimited energy, and my focus has improved significantly. If you like this video and you want to see more of my content, consider subscribing down below. It's completely free and it means you'll see more videos like this. Earlier I mentioned how I don't think eating fruit is a good idea, despite the fact that it does taste good to our palate, which I've attached above, so if you enjoyed this video, feel free to watch that one.